This is the BBC. This podcast is supported by advertising outside the UK. Thanks for downloading the In Our Time podcast. For more details about In Our Time and for our terms of use, please go to bbc.co.uk forward slash radio 4. I hope you enjoy the programme. Hello, the philosophy of Stoicism was founded by Zeno in the 4th century BC and flourished in Greece and then in Rome. Its ideals of inner solitude, forbearance in adversity and the acceptance of fate won many brilliant adherents and made it the dominant philosophy across the whole of the ancient world. The ex-slave Epictetus said, Man is troubled not by events but by the meaning he gives them. Seneca, the politician philosopher, declared that life without the courage for death is slavery. The stoic thoughts of Marcus Aurelius, the philosopher emperor, provided a rallying point for empire builders into the modern age. But what was stoicism? How did its ideas of inner retreat come to influence the most powerful and public men of the classical era? And does it still have a legacy for us today? With me to discuss the philosophy of Stoicism is David Sedley, Lawrence Professor of Ancient Philosophy at the University of Cambridge, the philosopher and historian Jonathan Ray, and Angie Hobbs, lecturer in philosophy at the University of Warwick. Angie Hobbs, Stoicism took its name from the colonnade or Stoa in Athens, where Zeno and his followers discussed their ideas. Can you give us a brief outline of what those ideas were? Yes, well, above all, uh, Stoicism presents us with a coherent system based on the integrated three pillars of logic, physics and ethics. They argue for a materialistic and deterministic cosmos, which at the conceptual level is composed of passive matter in, interpenetrated by active divine reason. At the observable level, this passive matter takes the form of earth and water, and the divine reason takes the form of a mixture of fire and air known as pneuma. And the key point <coughs> is that this divine reason organises everything for the best. This is the best of all possible worlds. Now, as an organic uh, entity, the cosmos has a set lifespan, and at the end of each cosmic cycle, all the matter is transmuted into pure, creative, rational fire, out of which the next perfect and absolutely identical cosmos is formed. It has to be identical because it was perfect to begin with. Now, human reason is a spark of the divine uh, fiery reason, and so we are part of a greater whole. And our happiness and our virtue lie in acknowledging that fact and accepting that whatever happens to us, even if at the time it seems to be terrible, is actually part of a greater providential plan. And if we can live in accordance with this plan and accept it, that is living in accordance with nature according to Zeno. How does this transfer over to what is best known about Stoicism, uh, the way that individuals should behave with the, their idea of inner probity and inner uh, certainty uh, in face of external slings and arrows and so on? Yes, well, we have to remember that at the time Zeno's setting up the Stoa in about 300 BC, uh, the Greek world, in, in Athens in particular, is looking very, very different from how it had uh, when Plato set up his academy nearly a hundred years before. Uh, in the interim, we've had Alexander the Great and Philip of, of Macedon setting up the Macedonian Empire, which has effectively destroyed uh, the Greek city-state, the polis, as an um, independent political unit. So it's a time when people are feeling confused, they don't know what's happening next, they're feeling far more powerless uh, than their grandfathers and great-grandfathers. Now, I think this has two particular effects. On the one hand, people are starting to look inward and thinking, well, I can't control my immediate the political environment. I can search for my inner salvation, uh, for my inner peace of mind. I can practice philosophy as a therapy of the soul to give me uh, stability and tranquility in time of, of often great uh, external disturbance. On the other hand, um, perhaps partly um, as a result of uh, the, the barriers of the Greek world breaking down under the Macedonian Empire, uh, we have people thinking of themselves as part of a greater unit than the old uh, individual polis, the city-state, and starting to think of the way that human beings connect up. So we're also getting this move outward to how humans connect with their, their 
their fellow men. Thank you. Jonathan, uh, Ray, Stoicism isn't the only philosophy in the 4th century. There are other schools of thought, most eminently perhaps the Cynics and the Epicureans. Uh, and they with the Stoics, the Cynics, Epicureans uh, and Stoics, are they quarrelling over the same, are they quarrelling over the same legacy, the Socratic legacy? And if they are, where are the Stoics in that, in that uh, argument? I'm not really sure that quarrel is quite no, the right word. No, it's a wrong word. word. I, because, I realize, that's why um, I switched to argument, we, we, yeah. And we, we tend to think nowadays of different philosophical schools as yeah. taking diametrically opposite positions on fundamental questions of theory. And I don't think it's like that when we're, when we're talking about Greek philosophy. And they're more like friendship networks, these different schools. It all goes back, and Socrates is, is the father of it all, of whom I think no one speaks evil. And after his, after his death in, I think it's 399 BC, Plato sets up uh, his school in his academy to, I think, to the west of Athens, and then a generation later, Aristotle sets up the Lyceum to the east, and then Diogenes the Cynic sets up his school to the to the south, and and then there's a, a new generation sets up their schools in the in the centre of the town, notably um, Zeno the Zeno the, the Cynic, and uh, Zeno, Zeno the Stoic. Zeno the Stoic, sorry, and choosing between these different schools at r around about 300 BC, I, it was more like choosing between. Um, Café Nero and Starbucks than choosing between rationalism and empiricism, because all of them promised to teach you how to lead a better life, how to lead the life of a philosopher, how to, how, how to imitate Socrates, in a sense, how to um, lead a life of virtue where virtue would lead you to happiness, where you'd understand that being, being good and being happy were... One and, this, one, one and the same thing. But Here's although, although there are friendship networks, and I accept that, and it's a, very, it's, a, it's a very illuminating point about what's happening in this very small city, nevertheless, one has to seek to define what... Uh, well, it's helpful, I think, mm -hmm. to define uh, Stoicism in relation to cyn the, the Cynics yes. and the Epicureans. So if you could tell us, what, I mean, at its, at its baldest, what the Stoics are holding on to and, and, and which direction they're going into, which is not be the direction is not being gone to, uh, being followed by the Cynics particularly and the Epicureans. OK, perhaps I could do it by way of a, of a story. Here's how it all began, at least according to accounts written uh, some time later. Um, Diogenes the Cynic, yeah. his cynicism... It has nothing to do with the modern sense of the word cynicism. His cynicism consisted of taking Platonism very seriously, so seriously that he absolutely despised the, uh, the, the social world. He despised human convention. He lived in a tub. He walked around naked. He masturbated in public he, to, to prove that uh, he didn't care what anybody thought. His pupil, Crates, rich man who carried on the tradition and gave away all his money and said that it was a wonderful exchange because he'd, he'd got in exchange a quart of lupins and the ability to say, I care for nobody. That was the, the great pro Zeno, at his age about 30, I think, right, about 300 BC, he's had a shipwreck. He comes to Athens and he's sitting in a bookshop reading Xenophon, mm. reading about Socrates reading about this wonderful man whose intellect enabled him to rise above his circumstances. Uh, and he asked the bookseller, is there anybody in Athens now who, uh, who carries on the tradition of Socrates? And the guy says, there's that man, there's your man, there's Crates walking past. And, uh, and so Zeno follows Crates, he becomes Crates' um, pupil. And here's how, here's how Crates teaches him. He's, he, he tells him he's got to carry a pot of lentil soup around, something kind of servile. Uh, Zeno is not happy about this, so he tries to hide it under his cloak. Yeah, Crates smashes the, uh, s smashes the pot so that he has this brown stuff dribbling like diarrhoea down his legs. And Crates insists, you, you must not feel ashamed of this. This is philosophy teaching through, um, through humiliation. Zeno then becomes, he, he never becomes as extravagantly exhibitionist about his contempt for the world. Stoicism, I would say, is cynicism for the shy. Right. Uh, so we know where we are with uh, spilt soup and goodness knows what going on Athens, but can we try to, David Sedley, can we just take it on and, and give us uh, the, the, the defining ideas of of Zeno in terms of, of behaviour, because that, I think, is what a lot of our listeners know about Stoicism. It is a way to behave. Yes, I think that's, that's absolutely right. Uh, the, uh, the whole uh, issue for Zeno started from Socrates. Socrates 
had made his, it at the top of his agenda to ask the question how we should live. But he'd also raised some very difficult I issues about what are the goods we should actually be pursuing in our lives. Because what Socrates pointed out is that although knowledge, wisdom, is an unconditional good, you can't go wrong so long as you know what you're doing. All the other things that people value in their lives and that actually structure the way they, um, that, that they um, form their ambitions and pursue them are things which are uh, in their own nature no more good than bad. So well, everybody wants to be rich. Everybody wants influence and reputation. But actually, wealth is no more good than bad because if you use it for good purposes, it's good. But if you use it to commit genocide, for example, it's, just, it's a greater bad. So too for all of these other supposed goods. And the, the legacy of Socrates to Zeno, among others, is the question, well, in that case, should we be pursuing these things at all? Should we, get, should we make any effort at all to uh, follow the norms of society, to, uh, to, uh, be, to, to be ambitious in conventional ways, to take part in politics? Now, Zeno tried, first of all, the cynic route. As Jonathan has said, his first uh, training was with a, a cynic, uh, the, the cynic uh, philosopher Crates. The story of the lentil soup says it all. Zeno was uh, was really too conventional a character to want to to, to go for the opt out solution that the cynics went for. And Zeno's um, great breakthrough was to see that there was a way in which you could adopt the same Socratic value system, but uh, but but nevertheless. Uh, lead a very conventional life, a life in which you take part in the politics of your city and uh, want your children to be properly educated and, uh, and to, to pursue, pursue the same goals. And the reason he, he gave was this, that although uh, there, it, it's true that things like wealth and even health and even life itself are not intrinsically good, because if you, it all depends on how you use them, nevertheless, nature has created us to pursue these things. It is our instinct from birth to pursue certain things and to avoid other things. And as we grow up and become rational, we, we find that increasingly we're simply by nature pursuing rational goals. And so the goal of life, according to, to, to Zeno, is actually to make your life totally in conformity with nature. And that doesn't mean na back to nature. It means a rational cosmic nature, which has an overall plan of which you are just a tiny part. And as you learn to uh, conform your activities increasingly to nature's rational plan, you, you discover that the things which, as a matter of course, you, it's natural to pursue, such as um, good health, uh, may actually have to be varied. So the, uh, the, the later Stoic Chrysippus said, normally speaking, I try to stay healthy because that's a natural thing to do. But if I knew that I was fated to be ill now, I'd actually want to be ill because my, I would know that my illness had some purpose. Now, of course, it's left to us to speculate what that purpose might be. It could be that it's to test you for your own moral improvement. It could be that your sickness is needed for somebody else to become virtuous, a, a Florence Nightingale, as it were. If there were no sick people, how, how could virtue, others acquire virtue? Uh, so that's the that is the the project. Uh, in the end, that if you if you succeed, you your life will be in complete harmony with nature. You will understand what nature wants for you, and you will actually go uh, along with it willingly. Uh, Zeno, uh, uh, well, sorry, Chrysippus actually uh, went on to say uh, in that an interpreter, same, a later interpreter. Of yeah, Zeno, Chry yes, yes yeah. Chrysippus, who was um, the main the most important of Zeno's followers, uh, put the point by the, just he continued the same remark about how he would want to be if he knew he was fated to be ill, he would want to be ill by saying likewise a foot if it could think it would want to get muddy. And what he meant is that you should think of your, your relation to the world as the relation, like a relation of your foot to you. It would be absurd for feet to go on strike and say, we refuse to get muddy, we refuse to get blisters, uh, uh, because that would be for them to misunderstand what it is to be a foot. A foot is not there for its own pleasure, it's there to, as a part of an organic whole, and that's just what your own relation to the world is. But unusually, as I know, as I've been told in the notes, in the history of philosophy, philosophers went from Athens to Rome to make a case uh, to do with some treaty or other. They sent philosophers anyway. And, and these philosophers gave us lectures about their philosophy, Stoics. Yes, well, it's absolutely right that, uh, that um, the, the year 155 BC was the year in which philosophy arrived in Rome. And it's, uh, as you say, the Athenians had been fined uh, a huge fine of 500 talents uh, for pillaging um, the city of Oropus. And they, b because um, Greece was under Roman control at this time, they, if they wanted to appeal against the fine, they had to, to appeal to the Roman Senate. And they took the most extraordinary decision. They decided they would send the three heads of the three major philosophers 
philosophical schools as their ambassadors to Rome. And th that, w that included uh, Diogenes of Babylon, who was then the head of the Stoic school, along with um, the head of the academy and the head of the per peripatetic school. And uh, these, when they arrived in Rome, these philosophers turned out to have the status of superstars. Incidentally, I should say that it did work. They did get the fine reduced to, um, to 100 talents. But what was really important... Tried over here, really. <laughs> <laughs> Happy days. Happy days. It's, like, it's like sending the Beatles <laughs> <Another job>. to, <laughs> as ambassadors. Straight out of in our time to the negotiating table. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but what the really important uh, event occurred in the few days they were waiting uh, to appear before the Senate because there were hundreds and hundreds of Romans who wanted to hear them, even though these people couldn't speak Latin. They, had, they spoke Greek and it relied on the educated Roman audiences who could understand Greek. They gathered crowds around them and they gave demonstrations of their philosophical virtuosity. Uh, and all of them made an impression. In fact, it was the head of the academy, Carneades, who really shot the Romans with his attack on justice. But the, the Romans were particularly impressed by Diogenes, the, the, the Stoic, um, who uh, was said to speak with great common sense and sobriety. And I think the Roman love affair with Stoicism really did be begin at that point. And then, Jonathan Ray, we have, we have Cicero, who we think was influenced by the Stoics, and, and the great uh, first real Roman Stoic philosopher was Cato the Younger. We're talking about the first century BC, if I'm right. So why do you think it, 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 um, it uh, dovetailed with Roman society so immediately, as David just point out, uh, uh, pointed out, and then continued and grew, in fact? And well, can it, tell it us how Cato the Younger took it, it up. It, it wasn't received without opposition. I mean, the older Cato, at the time of this delegation from Athens, was absolutely revolted by these Greek philosophers who were coming and, as he thought, corrupting the youth of Rome. They, he was putting them off their it was not only mi like military. To create a strong government. Uh, and, right? and, and one of his problems was that he thought was precisely this linguistic problem that the Greeks were telling well, philosophy was a Greek thing and it was taking place in the Greek language and he thought this was distracting people from their national duty to yeah, the... Yeah, but let's go to Cato the Younger who did take it up, who was a Stoic who, and Stoicism did take a hold on the, the Roman imagination and the Roman uh, morality. So what did Cato the Younger do to, to, to push forward that process? Well, uh, it's the time of the, the, the Civil War, um, 49 to 46 BC, we do tend to think, and it's maybe more because of Renaissance reconstructions than because of what actually happened at the time, that the, that the great heroes, Scipio, Pompey, Brutus and, and Cato, who, who you mentioned, were Stoic philosophers. They certainly had a certain respect for the idea of, of philosophy, but and Cato became a hero after his death, he became a, a kind of Mother Teresa figure. He was supposed, and he, he became. He took that his own life. He took his own life, uh, and, and the story is the story that was told again and again, and people started saying, "Oh God, not that story about Cato again." Uh, the story that was told again and again was that after he'd been defeated, he he'd retreated to uh, Tunisia, to North North Africa, with his troops, and he'd been he'd been defeated, and he spent a night reading Plato's Phaedo over and over again. He had Plato's Phaedo in one hand and he had his sword in the other hand and the next morning he disemboweled himself apparently quite unsuccessfully and after his death he, he came to be he, well, he, he was, he to was kill him. Uh, <laughs> well I think he needed a bit of help to be, he needed another another push um, the devil's in so the detail after, after his death he, he was canonized as this great uh, combination of, uh, of philosopher and politician and warrior. Can we talk about the way that, uh, about the Stoics' idea to life? Uh, we, we mentioned Cato the Younger and he took his own life and that seemed to be part of, of what was going on. They, not contempt for life, but life was no more important than, as David said earlier, than wealth and so on. And then bring it to Seneca, who no. was, the, who was a political advisor, what a job, to Nero, uh, <laughs> uh, and, and was also uh, a, a Stoic philosopher, and according to what I've read, the greatest philosophers. Now, can you just bring those together quite neatly, I hope? OK, yes, well, this goes back to what David was saying earlier about the difference between the Stoics' concept of the good and the indifferent. The only thing good in itself is virtue, which is living in accordance with rational nature and accepting whatever happens to you as part of the divine plan. Uh, other things such as life and death in themselves are indifferent, though usually under normal circumstances to be preferred. They make this uh, rather strange distinction between the good and the, the naturally preferred. However, there can be exceptional circumstances when life is not actually to be naturally preferred, when if you're being forced to do something that's against your will, which would sully your inner purity and moral integrity and freedom, then in those cases, 
it is acceptable to commit suicide. And of course, Cato felt it was going to sully his integrity to accept Caesar's pardon, Caesar, his arch enemy. Um, Seneca uh, was actually forced to commit suicide by Nero, but he decided to to accept this uh, decision and, and accept this death and make a kind of Socratic uh, theatre out of it. You know, I've got two people coming up who exemplify both sides of this. One is um, Nero and the other is Marcus Aurelius. We talk about the influence of Stoicism and yet Seneca, the greater philosopher, is advising Nero and where did that get Stoicism? I'd like to ask David that. And then we have the great emperor Marcus Aurelius who uh, uh, expresses views which are very, very close to Stoicism. And so it gets, as it were, through to him. So uh, uh, what was Seneca's relationship with Nero? What was he trying to do there that he, he seems from history <laughs> singularly have failed to do? Yeah. Well, yes, uh, Seneca's relationship to Nero was uh, started off in a rather accidental way. He was employed uh, by Nero's mother when Nero, Nero was 12, but not as a philosophical tutor to, uh, to Nero, but actually as his tutor in rhetoric. Actually, if she'd wanted him, to, Nero, to be trained in philosophy, which she didn't, she'd have brought a Greek in to do it. That was a, a Greek job, but Romans uh, were, uh, were the, 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 the relevant rhetoricians to call it, and Seneca was brought in to do this job because he was the greatest Roman literary author of the time. It was his reputation in literature. Nevertheless, he, um, he did... Uh, exercise uh, a very strong influence on Nero. And when Nero became emperor at the age of 17, um, Seneca did what was kept on as, as his advisor. And that's the point at which one might ask, was that the proper thing for a Stoic to do? To, to, to... And the answer is yes, Stoics had always um, thought that being adv an advisor to a monarch was one of the ideal positions for a philosopher to hold. They had, uh, th there was no Stoic commitment to the restoration of the Roman Republic rather than um, keeping the system of the, uh, the principate. Seneca is quite clear that he thinks the Republic was, could not be resuscitated and that monarchy, enlightened monarchy, was the right way forward. So from his point of view, his own theoretical point of view, he was doing exactly the right thing. Uh, and indeed, the first five years of Nero's reign were regarded by historians as one of the best periods of Roman rule. It was only after that, uh, five years into Nero's reign, when he murdered his mother and, and then went on to a whole string of other atrocities, that, uh, think that he really went off the rails. And that was the point at which one might have wondered why Seneca didn't get out. And in fact, he did make a number of attempts to get out of the imperial service, but that was not easy because, uh, it, because to resign would be taken a, as a sign of disloyalty. And, uh, and so it, it, was a, it was some years before he could, but eventually he was able to withdraw them. But by the time we get to Marcus Aurelius in the 2nd century AD, and he was emperor for about 20 years, Jonathan, we have an emperor who seems to have taken on Stoicism. He writes things in his meditations, which were taken up very much in the 19th century in, in this country. It's possible to live uh, out your whole life in perfect contentment, even though the whole world deafens you with its roar and wild beasts tear apart your body like a lump of clay, for nothing can shake a steady mind of its peaceful repose. So he's, we, we're there with, with the, the inner certainties of Stoicism and the philosophy uh, behind it, as expressed by An Angie at the very top of the program, uh, getting to the head, the sole, the greatest authority in the world at that time, in the, in the known That's Roman true. And world. I, and yeah. I, th I think it's, it, it's interesting to make the contrast between Seneca and, and Marcus Aurelius. Uh, people, uh, as David was saying, there are questions about whether Seneca was really a consistent Stoic, and I think the answers to those questions are that he was, but, but people have even, even thought that Seneca was, uh, might, might be the name of two different authors, one who, uh, one who was um, given to violence and the other who wrote these wonderfully peaceful um, uh, Just Stoic meditations. Yeah. And I, I, I don't see any contradiction at all. I, it seems to me that Seneca is the greatest of the Stoics because he recognises it. He says, you know, if you are in a state of sorrow, then there is nothing you can do to control it. Uh, when he tries to console people, he says the point is, is not to trick yourself out of your misery, but to conquer it. It seems to me he's the kind of Stoic who, re if you like, he had a lot to be stoical about. I mean, he did recognise that the passions are a very powerful force. Moving on to Marcus Aurelius uh, a century, a century and a half later, I say I feel that it's a tremendous step down intellectually. I find Marcus Aurelius rather prim, simple-minded and Pollyanna-ish. I, um, I didn't much enjoy working my way through the 12 books of his meditations uh, uh, yesterday. Well, there's one, there's one very good sentence in it, which, which, which is where he says, if anybody says to you, I will speak to you quite frankly, 
then you know that they're a hypocrite because if they have to say that they're being being frank, then then their frankness can't can't come to them naturally. So so don't believe. I think that's a very very good remark and one worth bearing in mind. By all broadcasters from now. (laughs) (laughs) I mean, uh, to tell you the truth, does the same purpose. (laughs) (laughs) Um, And he he only has one argument. I don't think he invented it, but the argument he keeps making is that uh, we live our life in the present moment. The past is lost to us because it's over and the future hasn't happened. Therefore, when we die, we don't. It's not the whole of our life that comes to an end because our previous life has already come to an end the moment before we died. So all that we lose when we die is a moment. And therefore, uh, living a life of 3,000 years or 30,000 years is no greater than living a life of 10 of ten years. And that seems to me so completely sophisticated. And actually, completely the opposite of Seneca, who does talk about how you have to understand a life as a whole. It seems to me that, um, that Marcus Aurelius is um, prim superficial um, and dull compared with Seneca. I'm going to, we're coming to the end. I, we've, we've, we're about, uh, uh, just for the listeners, we're about sort of two-thirds uh, where we should be, but mm. that's the way it goes. It's been engrossing. I find it engrossing. But I do want to do a massive fast-forward to a point that Jonathan made, Jonathan Ray made in his, in his notes, that, that, uh, that Stoicism came back a bit of the Renaissance, and Spinoza, dum 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 But it, uh, Marcus Aurelius and the ideas of Stoicism began to inform other empires, partic- and I, I, as, as you said, the British Empire, the idea of the Stoic re-emerged strongly then. Would you say? That's true, and I, th- and I think it's connected with Christianity. I mean, I think there, is, there, there was a serious tension between Stoicism and Christianity, particularly after the 16th century when Stoicism gets um, relaunched in, in, in Europe. Some people say, oh, well, Stoicism is exactly the same as Christianity, but I think serious Christians don't. I mean, Milton, for example, is absolutely appalled by the fashion for Stoicism because he, t- he talks about Stoic pride. The, the ideal of Stoicism is self-sufficiency, and Christianity, certainly the kind of Christianity that flourishes after the Roman after the Reformation, says there's no such thing as self, self-sufficiency. There's no such thing as, as salvation except, you know, through Christ and through, and, through, and, and through the Gospels. And so there was something kind of deeply pagan, uh, and deeply pagan, not just superficially pagan, about Stoicism. And it seems to me that that, that um, connects with the crisis of faith in Victorian England, that, that when people started having doubts about um, about Protestant Christianity, or characters like Matthew Arnold, they speak of. But uh, Matthew Arnold does actually talk of uh, Marcus Aurelius as a, as a great friend to him in times of adversity. When you think that God has, um, that the, the tide of divine providence has has gone out, then Stoicism leaves you with some kind of comfort. And I think all those ideas about empire and self sacrifice in the name of some greater good Marching come in to, to occupy the space yeah. vacated by Christianity. Mm. Yes, apparently Marcus Aurelius's Meditations was Rhodes' favourite work. I don't know how much went in that imperialist adventurer's uh, sensibility. But, also uh, on Bill Clinton's top yeah. 20 reading list. Oh, really? <laughs> yes. So, uh, I, I mean, Stoicism has been called the religion of the uh, 19th century British public school and... and Characters like Matthew Arnold, of course, the son of Thomas Arnold, but we're carrying that forward. We'll have to stop now, unfortunately. I find that engrossing. I'm kind of glad we didn't finish. We spent more time on the early bits. Next week, we'll be talking about modernist utopias. Thank you for listening. We hope you've enjoyed this Radio 4 podcast. You can find hundreds of other programmes about history, science and philosophy at bbc.co.uk forward slash Radio 4.